Chopper! In a world where zombies, ghosts, serial killers, and vampires all exist, it's Nico, Brian, Mike, and Dustin, and they are all that stand between you and the films that could end the world. Welcome to the Don't Go Out There Horror Movie Podcast. Welcome back, everybody, to the Don't Go Out There Horror Movie Review Podcast, uh, powered by the Roll Up Network. Just want to thank all our fans and listeners. I really appreciate all the support. Uh, before we jump into tonight's uh, legendary blood donor film review, uh, just giving a quick shout out to the website, don'tgooutthere.com. We got all of our interviews, our episodes, our celebrity shout outs, our store, our blog. Uh, everything about this podcast is on there and all of our social media links, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube. Go give us a follow or subscribe to us. We'd really appreciate it. Uh, we love talking to our fans. Uh, it makes our day. And uh, just one real quick shout out. We started a you know monthly reoccurring Patreon, the official Patreon of five and ten dollars a month. No pressure at all. We really appreciate any support. You know we have some of the best fans out there. Uh, it means the world to us. We are so excited by the participation in this blood donor campaign. For those of you who don't know or maybe new, we have launched a new Patreon campaign called Blood Donors. We have five donor tiers that range from, you know, just $5 monthly donation to even one-time donations as well. And and in exchange for keeping the lights on, we've added perks such as early content to bonus episodes, autographed pictures, t-shirts, and even joining us for an episode of your choice. Any donation goes straight to helping with web hosting, SoundCloud hosting, guest procurement. Again, you know, just thank you guys and girls so much. We have some of the best loyal listeners. We love each and every one of you. We can't believe every day that we get to do this. Just go to don'tgooutthere.com and click donate. And oh, yes, there will be blood. But again, not real blood. This is money, you animals. And tonight we're doing my man Andrew Ferguson's legendary blood donor pig. Uh, really fun movie, 1987's Predator. Andrew, you want to kick us off? Just general thoughts, why you picked the movie? Well, uh, I, I actually racked my brain for probably about two or three days on, on what I wanted to choose. And a lot of the stuff that you know I've seen in some of my favorite ones like you guys had already covered, and I was just kind of going at a shot in the dark. I'm like, well, technically, you know, it's an action thriller and everything like that. You know, perfect 80s action movie. However, it does have that little, you know, sci-fi hint to it. And plus, I've probably seen the movie about 200 times. And it's one of those that if it's on TV, doesn't matter where it's at in the movie, I will I will watch it till it's over. So it's, it's one of the ones that I like the most. All right, I'll go next real quick. Uh, I haven't told none of the uh, my co-hosts this, but... Uh, Predator is one of those movies that have some nostalgia to me as from a kid. Uh, I think one of the first movies I ever watched when I was, you know, just a little kid, my mom and my dad really loved Terminator 2. Uh, so I have that connection to Arnold Schwarzenegger from the get-go. Uh, Commando, we watched Commando a lot. And we watched Predator. I watched Predator a lot. Uh, so even though with this rewatch, the movie did, I would say, go down just a little bit for me. Uh, it's got a soft spot for me. I think Arnold's awesome, obviously. I think he's great. Uh, Jesse Ventura, just, you know, badass army guys. It's awesome. Uh, I still think the Predator's look is just absolutely incredible. Uh, the guy who portrayed him, he he did a great job as the Predator. Uh, my only complaint really is it just gets a little monotonous and slow in the middle. But I do like this movie. I still like this movie to this day, and it's a little bit special to me. Uh, Brian, you want to go next? <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely in Andrew's camp. Look. I don't think it gets much better than this for me. Now, you know, I've never looked at this, honestly, as horror, but it's definitely in the subgenre um, with some elements for sure. Um, so John McTiernan made, you know, making this movie a year before he did Die Hard. He just, he did so many of his movies, like, you know, are, are nostalgic for me. Last Action Hero, which is oddly enough, I think like the third time that at least that Last Action Hero has been brought up on this show, which is crazy. <laughs> but uh, Hunt for a Red October, you know, I, I love the dude. And look, this is the 80s movie that I fucking live for right here. You know, roided up, over the top, 
alpha badasses making jokes, comments, people, you know, would get canceled for now, you know, <laughs> cheesy one-liners, solving problems by shooting as many big ass guns as possible. Look, and just, and, you know, finally going hand to hand combat. Um, you know, you couple that with sci-fi. Are you kidding me? Like, look, let's fucking go. Like I felt, I felt like I needed to go do push ups and take pre-workout to even review this film, but I am pumped about doing it. Let's go. Go ahead, Mike. All right. So this movie doesn't have any nostalgia for me. Uh, I think I saw this movie for the first time probably about five, six years ago. Um, it, it took me a while to get to it. One, because I'm just not a big action movie person um, in general. And I know that's, so that, that could be a hot take. I know I'm not the only one in the world. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, movies like Die Hard and stuff like that, like I'm, they're, they're just not my cup of tea. Outside of Terminator 2, which I really think is good. Um, so it took me a while to get around to it. And like you guys said, it has some horror elements. So I think it falls squarely in some subgenre of horror. So I'm totally cool with that. Um, this, this, this kind of movie is just not my cup of tea. Um, it's got some fun stuff. It's got some good one-liners from, a you know, a, the whole cast of characters. Uh, rule of thumb, Arnold Schwarzenegger movies outside of T2 aren't really for me either. Uh, him and The Rock. Don't you dare sit there and disparage the good goddamn name of Jingle All the Way. Well, you know I like Jingle All the Way. I like Christmas. Okay, but for the most part, outside of that and Twins, <laughs> Arnold Schwarzenegger kind of does like the same movie all the time. Uh, and uh, him and the him and the Rock remind me a lot of each other in that way. And I like both of those guys because I love fitness and I love what they've done in that line of work. But I'm not a big fan of their acting. I think I've made that pretty clear before. But Schwarzenegger in this doesn't, to me, hog the screen. And so I think it's kind of okay. Um, look, this movie just doesn't sit with me. Like, I'm just not a big fan of what it does. I think The Predator looks good. Um, you know, I said in, the, in our group text before the show, I like <laughs> Alien vs. Predator. I think that's an interesting concept. But this first movie in the, in the franchise, just... Not for me. I will say the cast is good. Uh, there's some, you know, there's some people I like. Uh, it's uh, again, we're getting another wrestler here with Jesse Ventura. So shout out to that. That's always fun. Um, and I do like this with Carl Weathers. So I'll let the cast slide. But for the most part, the movie it just feels like it drags on. It's just very, you know, like Nico said, it's a little monotonous. And the first 45, 50 minutes is very just not my, not my scene. I'm not a big action guy. Um, a lot of the middle of the movie just them shooting at trees, which I don't think is very entertaining, um, quite frankly, because it doesn't do anything with the plot. So uh, I'm looking forward to talking about it, though. But as far as I'm concerned, eh, I am i don't know. I think I like it a little more than Dustin, but not much. <laughs> well, it's funny you should say that. Um, I, okay, I, I admitted to you guys something I never said out loud before, but uh, I'd never actually watched this movie all the way through until today at 6 o'clock p.m. So it's very fresh. On <gasps> I know how it, it actually blew my mind when Nico said this movie is nostalgic for him. That means that he has seen this movie at a young age and I had never seen this movie. And that that's just unheard of. But um, with all due respect, um, <laughs> I'm a little bit more action movie friendly than Mike. I would say I love Die Hard. Um, I, I like a lot of action movies. It's just certain action movies are kind of okay to me and this one i think it's because it's 2021 and i'm just now watching it for the first time i, re I really think that's what it is but uh some of the like the scene where we get the majority of the deaths in this movie and there's just explosion after explosion and bodies flying everywhere like it looked like a scene out of the expendables i mentioned that same thing being a uh negative point when we reviewed brian's pick army of the dead um just those types of action sequences <laughs> <laughs> those, those types of action sequences just aren't you're gonna my, make my Brian thing. Quit. You're, you're going to make Brian quit the show here. <laughs> Who suggested we do Army of the Dead? It was Brian. That's all I meant with all due respect. But um, anywho, so I, I like Arnold, um, except for when he was Mr. Freeze. That was a terrible movie, Batman and Robin. Um, I love Carl Weathers as well. And so, I mean, I... I to me, and we're gonna we're gonna get into what I would have done differently when I do my scene by scene. But the major, like the first 
45 to 50 minutes of this movie, I wish kind of, I kind of wish didn't exist. Um, because it's like they halfway through or 45 minutes through decided we're going to swerve you. We're going to go a different direction. What you thought you thought it was just a seek and rescue mission, but there's really an alien here to fuck things up. And so I wish they would have made up their mind a little sooner and went without, but it's okay. Um, I didn't hate the movie by any stretch of the imagination, but it's just not, not my favorite. And I think it's because it felt a little dated. All righty. Any more opening thoughts before you jump into it? Brian, Brian looks upset right now. <laughs> I, I can feel Brian oh, staring a hole scene through scene. me. Uh, the, and me. <laughs> you motherfucker. <laughs> All right, the film starts with Arnold's name. <laughs> I thought it was funny how Arnold's name was first and then the title card in a starry sky. Uh, we see a ship fly in the sky now. More opening credits and we see a chopper flying over the water. Some soldiers exit the helicopter and Dutch exits last like the badass he is. The men take jeeps to get to the general at the base. General tells Dutch they lost a chopper carrying a cabinet minister in the jungle. He tells Dutch he believes they're in a guerrilla hostage. He asks why they need us and just not the regular army. Dylan says it's because they heard he's the best. Then we get the iconic handshake arm wrestle scene. The two guys catch up some and Dutch says they're rescue and he asks what he needs to do. It's a one day operation to rescue the hostages. Dutch doesn't want Dylan joining, but we all have orders. Uh, a funky jam plays as the helicopters head into the jungle. Dylan tells Dutch there's no backup. We're on our own. Hawkins tells Billy a lame joke, and Blaine tries to give out some tobacco. Mac is shaving his smooth face for no reason. The guys begin to descend out the helicopters onto the jungle floor. The men wander, and they find the crashed chopper. Poncho climbs a tree and into the chopper, and we see the pilot is dead. Poncho says they stripped the chopper and it doesn't look like any regular one. Billy Billy tells Dutch some news and goes ahead to see what he can find. Billy drinks from a branch he cuts and he hears birds. He climbs up a tree and we see three skinned corpses hanging. Dutch recognizes the name of the dog tag and their green beret out of Fort Bragg. Dylan says he doesn't know anything as to why they should be here. Billy says he can't find a single track. It doesn't make sense. Payback time, Blaine says. And now we see in thermal vision the men are being watched by something. Mac tells Dylan he bl- he blows their position one more time. He'll bleed him and leave him. Dutch crawls quietly and uses binoculars and finds the guerrilla camp. He sees a man executed by a Russian. He has the other men join him and he gives out orders. Blaine cuts a tripwire real smooth and Mac kills a guy with a, a knife stab. Dutch somehow <laughs> isn't seen as he plants a bomb into the truck bed they're using for like a pulley system. He lifts the truck and it drives into their base. It blows up, killing several of them. Full on attack mode now, and there's a lot going on, so I won't be able to describe everything. Uh, Dutch's squad versus the guerrilla soldiers. I wrote, lots of gunshots, fire, explosions, etc. Dutch has an awesome kill, throwing a knife through a man's torso, pinning him to the wall. Stick around, he tells him. A woman sneaks up on Dutch, but he knocks her out in a failed assassination attempt. He calls for Mac and he tells Dutch the other hostages are dead. He says the cabinet minister was CIA. The others were Russian advisors, and they're lucky something big was going to happen here. Poncho launches grenades above he and Blaine, killing some folks. Dutch slams Dylan into the wall and calls him out for the lie of a mission. He tells Dutch he was the only one who could do it, and he's an expendable asset. My men aren't expendable, he tells Dylan. All right, Brian, that's the opening scenes. You want to kick us off? Yeah. So what's great about this, too, is... This was the beginning of all this lore that's now so just entrenched and mainstream completely. I mean, like now we know what kind of predator this is, particularly and the and the deep lore and and history with with the predator uh, species and their battles with the xenomorphs from Alien franchise. But but here, this shit was so unknown and just some basically invisible hunter. And I think that that adds so much to this film. You know, by the way, I didn't say it, and this is pointless, but I'm gonna say it anyway. This is my favorite Predator. Um, two, I think, sucks. I love the the third one, Predators, with Adrian Brody, and uh, the Predator, which is I think the fourth one, um, by Shane Black, who plays Hawkins in this one. I was very, very disappointed with and didn't like either. So I was really only two in this franchise that I really like. But to this movie, in my opinion, you can do away with the spaceship entrance completely. I think it should have just opened up with the helicopter and the team's entrance. Oh, and by the way, in that entrance, Arnold apparently couldn't get a cigar to light here. So it's uh, optical effects, you know, used on that thing there. So it's a nice little fun fact. And speaking of Arnold, 
him and Apollo Creed, Carl, Carl Weathers, that you son of a bitch handshake, so fucking epic. Um, actually, another fun fact, I had a guy in my fantasy football league win best team name one year for being called the handshake from Predator. I mean, I, I don't think you could beat that shit. That's the best team name ever. And Carl Weathers joked in the interview, actually, that Arnold Schwarzenegger got him to, addicted to cigar smoking during filming this. Shane Black came up with those jokes. Hawkins tells in the films, too. Like I said, he did that latest Predator, which I'm not really a fan of. But, but something else is, you know, he's actually writing The Last Boy Scout during his free time here on set. And <laughs> these jokes, Jesse Ventura's comments, um, Hawkins' jokes, wouldn't probably be let in a movie now. But you know what? Whatever. That's my type of humor. Shit is hilarious to me. It's such to me. It's such fucking amazing writing and one liners in this. Um, <laughs> you never were that smart. It's just John and, and Jim Thomas, the writers to me, they're just lyrical fucking geniuses. And I mean, stuff like wait, we got stick around. We got knock, knock dug in like an Alabama tick. Ain't got no time to bleed. It's just a fucking symphony of the written word by God. I swear. And uh, anyway, let me just say this. We talk about the soundtrack being a character sometimes in, in movies like Halloween. The jungle in this is its own character, in my opinion. And uh, McTiernan keeps it in focus, I think, the majority of the movie, too. I mean, it's more than just like a set. You know, it's it's the fucking, it's the hunting ground. It can uh, it can grab you with this whole, like, claustrophobic feeling and, like, and, and it can just kind of, like, let you go at the same time. Well... The Jungle and Blaine's fucking amazing gun, Old Painless. Definitely their old char- their own characters for sure. Um, I love this set of scene. I think so much amazingness. Again, the only thing I would change is the spaceship at the start. Um, we don't need that. I think it's it's doing too much. But that's all I had. Yeah, uh, right off the top, I want to agree with you about the spaceship thing. There's a part of me that thinks the reveal of Predator later on would have meant more without it. Um, I think, for me anyway, if you get... I mean, that's... That way, there's no dead giveaway if you're a first-time viewer. So I agree with that completely. Look, as much as I don't really like Arnold Schwarzenegger, the actor, I, I do like the on-screen, the on-screen chemistry with him and Carl Weathers. Like I think that's a good duo. Um, but the, but you know, outside of the handshake, which I love, and this is an audio medium, so you guys can't see it, but our guest host has the freaking handshake on a T-shirt right now. So that's pretty awesome. Um, it's one of the the greatest gift gifs of all time, however you decide to say it, it's awesome. Uh, iconic. The, you know, the, the you son of a bitch and all that stuff. But this is, after that, the plot is a little, it's just a little meh to me. Um, I, I have a hard time investing in it because, again, like I said at the top, action movie, not really my cup of tea. Um, Jesse Ventura and, and just about everything. Look, I like him as a wrestling commentator. I think he was a good heel uh, wrestler in his time. But as an actor, uh, I think he lacks. <laughs> so so not a like, super believable character, even though he served and all that stuff. Like, I get it. I get it. I got it. But like as far as you know, this movie goes, this cast of characters, like the cast, the acting is fine. I just, this plot is very, I don't want to say hokey because a lot of, that gets thrown around a lot with 80s films that, you know, don't age well. But I just think the set of, you know, the scene, here in the helicopter doesn't age particularly well. Not the humor. Humor's fine. I don't have a problem with, you know, certain jokes that are obscene or whatever. That's fine. You get a lot of, uh, to me, too much, again, preference. You get a little too much action. You get a little, and, you know, you have the attempted assassination, which I just think is an unnecessary plot. Having this woman in the movie at all, to me, <laughs> doesn't, I, I don't really know what purpose it does serve. And, uh, I know that's kind of a complaint that I've read online before, but I, you know, after seeing this movie three times now, I kind of agree with that. I just don't know why she's there. Um, but I mean, I, I mean, I don't know if it would make the movie better if you took her out or anything. I just don't think her plot line serves much of a purpose. Um, now, again, this movie, what it does succeed at is one-liners and memorable quotes and stuff like that. So for that, I give it a positive. But this set of scenes is where the movie, to me, starts to fall a little bit just because I'm not invested in this story. Um, And that's pretty much all I had on this scene. Go ahead, Andrew. 
you guys are right. Uh, the very beginning of the movie, when the spaceship comes out and you see the title card, really doesn't serve any major purpose except for maybe just to you know give you something to back your mind to think, hey, you know, this isn't your standard action jungle shoot 'em up movie. There is a little sci-fi involved in it. Uh, I always like to play the game. The very beginning of the movie, you just kind of stare at the screen and see if you can actually spot the ship when it kind of pops in out of the stars. Just ways to keep myself amused sometime. Uh, I've been in the army for uh, about 20 years and when I see movies like this I tend to you know spend half the time critiquing you know that's not the way the uniform is supposed to be worn that's not how they would do the only thing I really think of in this movie like at the very beginning uh when they're all flying in they're, um, they're all wearing like civilian clothes and they're really standing out everybody else is in their army fatigues you got your uh locals that are in their normal garb so you know if, I, if i'm a spy or if i'm somebody that's you know watching the camp and i see this whole helicopter load of guys get off and they're dressed different and they're acting different looking different i'm definitely going to you know raise a flag to somebody uh my favorite thing about this this movie especially the, the very beginning and the helicopter scene especially uh we were sitting at my house uh, as a family watching the movie i think i was 11 years old good time to watch a movie as a family what can i say um the scene on the helicopter when Blaine is passing around or trying to pass around the chewing tobacco to everybody and everybody's turning him down and then he uh, quotes the famous line of this stuff will make you a goddamn sexual tyrannosaurus just like me my father gets up off the couch walks over to the VCR hits the eject button takes the tape out and looks at my mom and says take this back to the video store tomorrow now dad drove a truck uh, the next morning Monday morning he got up uh, kissed everybody goodbye and left that afternoon Mom, we got home from school. Mom pulled the tape right back out, put it in, let us let us finish watching the movie. Uh, I am very grateful that she did that. One, one of my favorite stories about that one. Uh, the camp attack scene, you know, when we get to that part, it's, it's 80s glory at its very best. Uh, any other movie that it didn't have this element that it, we will see later on in the movie, this would basically be your ending scene of the movie. You know, Dutch and his gang comes in. Uh, ready to do battle, you know, starts the old, you know, take them out, take out the guys on the outskirts, and then let's just go in there, guns and blazing, and just start knocking them out. I mean, that's it's per, it's basically the perfect '80s action sequence. I am curious about Anna, though. I mean, what role does she perform at the camp? You know, she's cleaner, more nicely dressed than everybody else. She's obviously not someone's administrative assistant. I mean, you know, she is there. She does have a gun, but you know. Really, what role does she play? She's she's just kind of there, and you know she just may be there for you know just to add a little extra character to the movie that's not part of the uh, muscle bound gang. And, and that's all I have for this set of scenes, guys. Yeah. Um, so I, you guys touched on what I was talking about earlier. If you're gonna make it to where it's this swerve and the predator was unexpected and like holy shit, it's something else. It's not just these uh, gorilla enemies that they're fighting and the Russians in the jungle then don't show the spaceship flying in. Don't show the, uh, the thermal vision stalking camera view. Like literally just make us think that we're, we're all the way bought into. It's a action movie. It's a jungle rescue mission by the army or whatever branch they are. Make it that. Or if you're going to go the other way and you want us to, you don't want to swerve us necessarily just go, Eliminate the whole rescue mission altogether. Have it to where it's just a team in the jungle that, you know, you can imply that they're on a mission, a rescue mission, but you don't need all the explosions and all the deaths and the action sequence we've seen. The only reason they included that in was just, uh, you know, it was just to show off their pyrotechnics and their stunt work because it served no purpose. It didn't advance any kind of storyline. Uh, Anna, again, you guys mentioned it, but. Could have done without her altogether just because in the grand scheme of things, she serves no plot. Um, also, what a shitty uh, assassination attempt. You know, I've never assassinated anyone, but I like to think that if I were going to, I wouldn't just slowly creep up behind them with the gun and let them gain the upper hand. You have a gun. Just pull the trigger. But um, whatever. Uh, I did think it was funny, though, hearing the line, my men are not expendable because, like I said, this whole action scene reminds me of the movies, the expendables uh, and where it's just a huge display of pyrotechnics and stunt work and explosions and gun and fire. awesomeness. God, you like those movies for real? Oh yeah, dude. It's this, it's this, it's this part that you just said that didn't advance the plot. You know what it advances? Awesomeness. That's what it advances.
Apparently it advances your pants, but that's it. I do not like those movies. Um, <laughs> I, I it just it's just not my thing. Uh, and I know that some they obviously were commercial hits. I mean, hell, they had every action star that ever starred in a movie in those movies. But um, back to this one, it's just that same kind of feel, like <laughs> unnecessary explosions and um, unrealistic explosions and bodies flying everywhere, an ungodly amount of deaths that were too high to count. Um, spoiler though, as bad as I, as much as I dislike this death sequence in this uh, camp explosion sequence, none of them were my least favorite kill. Um, they would be under normal circumstances, but I'll, I'll leave a little cliffhanger there. Back to you, Nico. I, before we move on, I will say I agree with what Dead Meat James said in his uh, kill count uh, about this little scene. Is you have no sense that none of Dutch's team is in danger, which kind of takes away yeah. from it. So I, I agree with him on that. But I'm with Brian. I don't. I don't have a problem with this scene, honestly. I mean, it's Arnold Schwarzenegger being a badass. It's awesome. Uh, and, I, and I will I will say I've never I've seen this movie a bajillion times and I guess I just didn't maybe I didn't research it enough but I've never I never saw or even thought about the fact that Anna was was pointless and to be honest she she completely is so you guys have definitely changed my mind on on her at least. Our right, Hawkins tells Dutch that air surveillance says gorillas are everywhere and Dylan says Anna comes with us. Dutch asks Billy for a way out. He says through the valley, which doesn't seem promising or easy. Then we get more thermal shots, and I agree with Dustin. They should. Uh, we got a fan question. We'll touch on some of this stuff later. Anna is snapping on Dylan, and Matt calls for him. He has him turn around and kills a scorpion on his shoulder. Hawkins tells Billy another joke and finally makes Billy laugh, which he had a pretty awesome laugh. More thermal shots, and we hear the predator growling. The men are back to jungle to the jungle trying to find a safe way. Matt tells Blaine this is the wor- the worst brush they've ever been in. Anna almost gets away from Dylan, but Poncho stops her. Dutch has him stop when he sees Billy stop. Billy tells Dutch there's something in these trees. Anna grabs a limb as more thermal shots of Predator watching Billy and Dutch. Anna hits Poncho and runs off. Hawkins chases after her and tackles her. We now see the Predator in like his camouflage, holographic state. Uh, his form appear and kills Hawkins and drags him away. Poncho grabs her and he sees the blood trail and follows it. He sees the abandoned gear and all his guts on the ground. Poncho tells Dutch he needs to come look, and he asks where's his body. Poncho asks Anna where's the body, and she says the jungle came alive and took him. Dylan doesn't believe it. Then Dutch asks why didn't the gorillas take away his weapon or his radio. He says the same thing happened with Jim Hopper's body. It's a pattern. Back to the jungle. We now see Hawkins' body at the top of the tree hung upside down bleeding. All right, go ahead, Brian. Yeah, I meant to say in the last group of scenes, but I absolutely love the whole team aspect of this movie's. Not just this movie, but I mean, one of my favorite movies ever is Tears of the Sun. Um, hell, Blade Two. Of course, I gave Aliens a, a ten. I, I just I love the team movies where they're like getting picked off one at a time. Um, and here too, I mean, just like kind of Aliens, you know, they they've got their own personality they bring to the team. And I know McTiernan took a page from Aliens like as far as the fact that he had the cast training together on location with the weapons, you know, the military training uh, just to help, you know, build that camaraderie between the whole team. And I I thought you could see it anyway. Um, And I know we just did Cloverfield. Fantastic movie, by the way. And Jaws, again, fantastic movie Uh, where they're, you know, they're somewhat of a a monster movie. And I feel like that this kind of takes a cue um, like those did from Jaws, where it only shows you, you know, a little bit of the predator at a time, um, you know, mostly the point of view shots and, and it helps build up that whole paranoia, um, especially in that last scene after Poncho and, you know, Hawkins walk away and you get to kind of see that, uh, that infrared for a prolonged amount of time. Um, I agree though with Dustin um, and I guess what Nico said earlier that, that, you know, maybe they showed a little bit too much of the, the infrared. I mean, we got the point after the first time, like, Hey, there's something else out here. So I think that this would have been a cool time to see it for the first time. Um, where you get that prolonged amount of time, like I said, and hear the recordings of, of what we just witnessed. Again, wouldn't waste it on a broke dick dog. Hey, lyrical geniuses. Don't know what else to say about that line. That's just amazing. Rob uh, Zombie, yes. And, and if I, <laughs> maybe, maybe. But uh, but to me, it just it hits a little bit different here. It, it, I love it. I love it a little bit more. Um, anyway, what was I saying? Oh, the, the, the scene with Mac and Dylan and the Scorpion. 
Um, I, I love that scene. Hell, real venomous snakes and scorpions invaded the set during filming. But but I love the tension, you know, that it builds up real quick before showing you that whole scorpion. Um, you know, Bill Duke's Mac may be my favorite character in this movie. I mean, he was he was in Commando with Arnold two years before this movie was released, and I love him in this one. And uh, lastly, you know, I thought it was great effects on the skin bodies, you know, from the first group of scenes. And of course on, on Hawkins here, the, uh, the legendary Stan Winston team, of course, just, just such amazing work in this with the effects, um, the predator design, the bodies, everything still holds up today. I think in that regard, and, and it's tremendous as far as practical effects go. Now the effect on, you know, the cloaked predator a few times, especially in this group of scenes, isn't great in some spots, but overall definitely fine, especially for the time period. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, so I like the concept with the Coach Predator. Like, I, I'm a fan of that that being in this movie, but I just wish it was the whole movie. Like, I don't think we get quite, like I said, there's too much of an action movie vibe for me. Um, but, you know, this set of scenes is not like the last set of scenes to me where there's some really good dialogue or some funny dialogue. There's some one-liners that are very memorable. You know, that Brian's already gone over, but you really don't get anything that I think is very plot driven moving it forward outside of the you know d- 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 discovery of surveillance and now we know there's some weird predator thing i guess but like to me like you just mentioned brian and dustin's already mentioned too much of the infrared stuff um but i don't but i like that they at least kind of show you that this thing can mimic uh you know the people on the green you know the people that are in the jungle there like i like that it's kind of like soaking that all in again I like that idea. I, I just wish that it was more of the movie than we get. Um, I agree with that. They should have. They should have used that more. I, I yeah. definitely agree with that. Yeah, and I think again, I, it's not the predator itself that I don't like. I, I just wish he was kind of stalking them and doing it the whole movie. I feel like this takes a really long time to get there, or it feels that way. It's probably not that long, but it feels like it takes a really long time to get to the point of oh, there's this thing they can't see that well attacking them um so again it, when the when you're watching it and you're taking notes it kind of just feels monotonous one thing i do say you, you 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 mentioned it brian the effects on the skinned people look fantastic that is a really cool shot to me um or at least i think it is and golly it looks gr- like there's some effects in this movie you mentioned it that do not age well they just don't some of the kills don't um the cloaked uh, predator doesn't but this does and that you know there's something later that i think holds that really really well um but that's pretty much all i yeah that's pretty much all i had that you didn't already touch on brian so a fun fact i read on a uh, imdb was that uh the director wanted you know shane black when he played hawkins to be as nerdy as possible hawkins wanted to wear some more of a ballistic style glasses uh something proper for the field but based the way his character was written i think he wanted to be people portrayed as more of a nerdy character uh if you guys ever get a chance google bcgs uh that's what uh they issue out in basic training in the army that stands for birth control glasses and if you ever google bcgs you'll see why they're called that they make you look as unattractive and goofy as possible and these aren't exactly those but it's basically the the exact same setup uh I've seen a lot of people wear them, and it just, it just kind of scares you immediately. Uh, horror movies love a good killer point of view. You know, Michael Myers stalking, you hear him breathing through the mask, you see him looking at people, Jason Voorhees, you know, all the best ones done it, and it's been done time and time again. I like, you know, this one especially when Hawkins gets killed uh, as a predator rolls up on him when he's trying to calm down Anna, you know. Not, you see him just like come right up on top of him with that with his infrared nothing like that had ever been done before they've tr- they they redo it now you know with the more more better cgi and stuff like that but just that original first one for some reason always holds a a lovely place in my heart i've always ever since i was a kid always wondered what it is what's left of hawkins like when poncho pulls those branches down and you just see that little pile i mean there's no there's no scale so you don't know if if that's his all of his internal organs or if it's uh you know just a small basically just a a little bit of his intestines there's really no way of knowing and except for that one little scene when you see it you really don't get another look at it just always something i've always just wondered about uh one of my favorite things about this this movie especially the battle scene and everything like that um 
The gun that uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger is using, he's got an M16 with a uh, M203 grenade launcher attached to it. Uh, when I was in Iraq in 2007, uh, I was a budget analyst, so you know, really didn't need anything special. But the guy I was replacing had the exact same kind of gun as Arnold Schwarzenegger, and I'm thinking to myself, you know, wait a minute, this isn't fair. You know, we're, we're both doing the same job. Uh, why don't I get the cool gun like that? That being said, had the enemy, you know, breached the gates and got to the finance office, I'd have been worse than useless and it had already been over by that way anyway. But, you know, it's always just made me wonder, you know, how come I couldn't have a gun like that? And one last thing. Now that I think about it, here is the only time that Anna serves any purpose in the movie. Uh, had she not, you know, hit Poncho in the face with the, uh, with the stick and took off running, the group would have never been separated. You know, they would all still stay together and, you know, possibly been able to, you know, do, do better defending themselves. However, you know, Hawkins gets away from the group. The Predator sees his opportunity and then he can just kind of dive right in and, you know, start doing some killing and it just messes up the whole, the whole dynamic of the team. I believe it was Mike Tyson that said, you know, everybody's got a plan until you get punched in the face. This is their punch in the face moment and the only reason the moment happened is because Anna ran away. So she did fulfill some purpose. All right, so uh, <clears throat> this set of scenes, yeah, there's a lot, to, like I said already. Now we get the sense that there's a threat there other than the gorillas. So I wish they would have saved the suspense, saved the thermal vision uh, for now. Save, don't show us the spaceship in the beginning. Just save it for now. Uh, it would have made it more special, more creepy. Um, one thing I will say about this movie is it could not fly uh, if it were being made in 2021. For other reasons other than the dialogue, uh, the animal cruelty in this movie is uh, really something. That was a real scorpion that they uh, stabbed in, in with the knife there. Uh, that bird, apparently, they really kicked that bird earlier in the movie when they found the flayed <laughs> bodies. So PETA would have had a field day with this movie. Um, God, that, I know it's uh, awful, but I laugh every time, dude. I I'm laugh sorry. my ass off at that one. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I do like that they allude to someone in the camp having an idea that something else is going on. Uh, you know, and Anna saying that the, the jungle came alive and grabbed him. I like that because everyone's like, nah, come on, what the hell? And it, it kind of builds some, some doubt and suspicion behind, the, uh, between them. There's some good moments of tension between the crew here, between the team and this set of scenes. Um, it's just at this point of the movie, I'm like, okay, let, let's let's get let's get it going. Like you you got me amped up with that action scene where like fifty fucking people died, and now we're just kind of lulling and lollygagging through the jungle. Um, so I, I wish that the action was a little bit more evenly paced, um, but or just don't give me the action before because this set of scenes does a great job of building suspense for what we're gonna get, and that's awesome. So it just feels a little off balance to me a little bit. Um, you guys touched on a lot of other stuff I had, so I'll just throw it back to you, Nico. Man, fuck them birds. <laughs> yeah, I'm with you on that. Uh, Blaine follows like this rustling noise, but it's just a jungle rodent. He turns around and he's shot through his back by a plasma shot. Max sees the camouflage predator in his yellow eyes and opens fire. The rest of the squad opened fire on the jungle, <laughs> rationing ammo be damned. Max <laughs> says he saw it. Dylan sees the giant hole through Blaine's body. No shrapnel or metal, and the wound is cauterized. Dutch tells Dylan to call on the radio. He tells Mac to start setting traps, and Anna, she touches some of the predator's blood she sees on a plant. Mac tells Dutch he's rigged the place up. Mac pays his respects to his friend Blaine again and takes another drink from the flask. He leaves the flask with Blaine. Anna notices the blood on her pants is like kind of glowing. We now see the predator performing some first aid on itself, and it lets out a roar of pain. Dylan calls on the radio, but no help can come. Ditch uses the We're Expendable assets line on him. Dylan asks Mac what attacked them. He, he saw its yellow eyes, and he let off 200 rounds. Nothing could have survived, he says. Poncho asks Anna again what she saw. The jungle came alive and took him. Billy is scared. Something out there waiting on us. It ain't no man. We're all gonna die. And Dylan doesn't believe. Mac is on night watch and he gives a speech to Blaine. He says he's going to cut his name into him. They hear steps and they, they see a trap has been set off. They call for Mac and run to him. We see Mac <laughs> we see Mac going ham, stabbing a boar to death, pun intended. 
They ask Anna why she didn't run away. She's scared. Billy shows Dutch that Blaine's body is now gone. Next morning, the guys wonder how something took Blaine's body without tripping off a wire. Dutch says it's using the trees. He grabs Anna and asks what she saw. No more games. It changed colors like the chameleon. It uses the jungle. Dylan says, a fucking lizard. Dutch cuts her hands free and she tells him they wounded it. It's blood got on the trees. If it bleeds, we can kill it, Dutch says. All right, go ahead, Brian. If it bleeds, we can kill it. One of the great, that's such a great line. Um, <clears throat> Blaine going down with that old amazing gun, old painless. That just, it just shows you how powerless they are, which, which to me is, is great writing because I mean, how many times can you sit down and watch a horror movie and not be like, Oh God, what a dumb decision. <clears throat> you know, that's what I, and I think I said this during the review, but that's what makes O3 chainsaw so good to me because, you know, as far as putting myself in the guy's shoes, you know, because I'm a dude, uh, you, you have a hard time not making the same choices and, and you're helpless. And I think that that's a, that's a feeling that, that lets your audience members, you know, stay in the movie and not be taken out of it. <clears throat> but Blaine's death, that hole through his chest, amazing effects. And I actually said out loud, I bet you have time to bleed now, Ventura, because yeah, I talk to myself sometimes when I'm watching movies and, you know, especially <laughs> with dad one liners, and I even said Ventura, you know, like Ace Ventura's landlord does. Anyway, yes, went way off track there. Anyway, <laughs> yes, Satan. Um, that shot with everyone just firing every bullet they have, mowing down trees. I mean, I thought it was good camera, amazing camera work there. You know, you had quick cuts. Um, I thought the sound mixing there was fantastic. And, you know, it's just a, such a show of strength in so many movies and it would be in, in any other movie with just all of these guys with these 20 inch fucking pythons just blasting away at the, but, but I'm in mean, here. It's almost helpless. I mean, it, it's crazy when these guys in this movie are the prey and, and you know, it, it kind of demonstrates that whole helplessness right there. And, you know, especially with, with Mac just holding that trigger down, you know, well, after he'd run out of bullets, I thought that was great acting right there by Duke. Um, again, he's my favorite character, I think. And, and, you know, you can tell he's just, he's terrified. And I thought it was a nice little slow moment there. You know, it's something you don't get much in this movie. Um, but as far as the slow moments go, when, uh, when you know, when Mac and, and was, you know, kind of having that moment with, with dead Blaine. Um, you know, they find some of the Predator's blood here. A little fun fact, it was actually used for a mixture of, uh, of liquid uh, inside the glow sticks and some KY jelly. So, and you know, and, and this kind of seems like as good a time as any to bring up this delightful little fun fact here. Jesse Ventura was delighted to find out from the wardrobe department that his arms were one inch bigger than Arnold Schwarzenegger's. He suggested to Schwarzenegger, because he knew that information, that they measure their arms with the winner getting a bottle of champagne. Ventura lost. Why? Because Arnold, my man Arnold, told the wardrobe department to tell Ventura that his arms were bigger. Just fucking amazing that's just a delightful little fun fact for you go ahead mike <laughs> i love that uh okay uh so uh, look this is probably my i won't say my favorite set of scenes but it's the one i like r r right after the ending it's probably my favorite set of scenes um i love blaine's death i think those effects hold up really well i think Ventura's facials are really good. Like, I think all that is is a really good part of this movie. Um, but then you get, and I know, Brian, you, you know, if it's for you, that's great. You get this scene where they're all just shooting into the fucking trees. And I get it. It looks cool. There's, you know, it's, it's loud. There's a lot of action. I got it. And if you're in the mood for it and it's for you, that's great. To me, it was a waste of about three and a half minutes. Where they're just shooting down trees, uh, it's just not not my cup of tea. I, I I felt like, all right, are we done doing this now? You're not hitting anything. Like, I mean, eventually they do hit something. You know, I got it, but they're kind of just mowing down trees. They're doing more damage to the forest than you know half the uh, the notebook paper companies. Like, it's not <laughs> like it. It just doesn't do a whole lot for me. And I know that's a very iconic scene, but I also have you know. I, I know I'm not alone in that. I've, you know, seen it throughout the years as far as the criticism of this movie. So I'm not alone, but I know that I'm in the minority on that. A lot of people just like it because it's giant guns and it's machismo, and that's great. Normally, I I like that shit. 
Uh, but for whatever reason, this movie it just did not work uh, for me. Now, I like the blood scene. I, I like that we're getting a little bit of a story development. Oh, this thing can bleed, and its blood is neon green or whatever you know, whatever color hi highlighter green, whatever the fuck. Uh, it looks like an Oregon uniform. Um, I like that. All right, Andrew, go ahead. Uh, so, so, so let me start this portion out by uh, giving a little shout out to my hometown, uh, Callaway, Virginia. It's in Franklin County, uh, moonshine capital of the world, made famous by the uh, uh, the bootlegger movie called Lawless. Uh, there was a little bit in that movie. It was a little far-fetched. Uh, there was a scene where the guy walks from uh, Boone's Mill to Burnt Chimney in about two and a half hours, and that's about a 30-minute car ride, so that, that ain't going to work. Uh, the reason I bring that up is uh, the town I grew up in, tiny, tiny little town, no cable television. So a uh, huge wrestling fan growing up. Uh, that's how I knew who Jesse the Body Ventura was. Uh, I got my Saturday morning fix of uh, Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling and NWA on Saturday mornings, and really the only WWF I got was, you know, when you would see Saturday night's main event. Now, this is long before internet spoilers or anything like this, so you never really, nothing was really given away unless someone goes and sees something before you had. Well, they were in the middle of making the movie, and uh, Jesse the Body Ventura is doing commentary, and he makes mention about being, like, being in the movie, but he actually just drops right there on the screen that, hey, you know, even though I'm the biggest star in the movie, you know, they killed me off second. So that's why I'm back here working, you know. As a kid, you're like, oh, well, yeah, give stuff like that away. And, you know, I like to think I was a Jesse Body Ventura fan. I mean, you know, just wrestling fan in general. Like, anytime you see somebody somewhere that you like or you know, you automatically like them when you see them in the movie. So I always said, always cracked me up that that happened. Uh, and here we get another, also another example of Anna's overall uselessness, you know, after the gun battle, which apparently, you know, if, when you see the predator actually starting to bleed and leave the blood on the leaves, that's after he'd been shot, uh, when Mac hit him with his M60, this is long before he picks up the minigun and starts, you know, just hosing the place down, you know, after everything's over, she goes over and she sees the blood on the leaves and, you know, she sneaks a little bit, puts it on her side. And they come up and collect her. You know, what is the benefit of not telling them, hey, come look, there's, what is this? This ain't me human blood, this is something else. Or, you know, hey, we got him, you know, he's wounded. Why in the world would you keep that a secret? It literally serves absolutely no purpose. So once again, she is, you know, just fulfilling some form of role that is basically just making it worse for everybody. Yeah, so uh, uh, on this set of scenes, uh, you know, first of all, I think the, the predator effects are great for the time period that this movie was made not just the suit itself but the uh, the camo slash translucent uh effect i thought that was great um i too wrote down like what a tremendous waste of ammunition now listen i've got guns i like to go to shooting range i like shooting guns but in movies i don't know it just it takes me out of it sometime when it when things get excessive not just gunfire when anything gets excessive uh and i felt like it, it was in this movie Especially like you said, port, uh, ration control be damned. Like, yeah, like you're you're gonna run out, my boy, and you got a you got a fucking alien out there. You got to kill. Don't be wasting it. Um, this team, I really love that this team is a lot like if Kevin McAllister grew up and joined the military, because they are booby trapping the hell out of this jungle, and I really respect a good booby trap. Um, now, on the flip side, uh, to our our guest. Andrew, you know, I grew up watching wrestling too. However, I was a little pleased when Jesse the Body got taken out because I'm not a Jesse the Body Ventura fan at all. So that death is okay in my book. Um, but yeah, this this set of scenes does. You you mentioned it, Brian. This set of scene delivers an iconic line, probably one of my favorite lines in the movie. And that's one thing that I will agree with you guys on: the dialogue and the one-liners and the quotables in this movie are fantastic, top notch. One of my favorites is if it bleeds, it can die or be killed, whatever he said, however he delivered it. I thought that was a great line as well. But, um, yeah, overall, I really like that we're getting the suspension built. And it's a very tense set of scenes. And it just I like how they're building us at this point for the final showdown. Are more traps being set up? And Dylan asks, you really think this Boy Scout bullshit will work? Dutch says he should help. So, like Dead Meat James says, takes his shirt off and gets them biceps to working. Uh, Mac is shaving his smooth face again for no reason. Anna says this only happens in the hottest years. She, like, tells Dutch, like, 
of, of the past of this happening. They found men sometimes skinned and butchered. Dutch grows impatient and walks in the middle of the traps. A trap engages in ca- catching the predator. He shoots plasma that causes a log trap to hit Poncho. The men now see the predator escape. Mac chases after, and Dylan goes after the predator as well. Poncho is hurt, and Dutch helps him walk. Mac's going to have him some fun as he pulls out this gun with a, a huge magazine. If that's the proper term, I don't know. Honestly, I don't know guns that well. Dil- Dylan follows Mac's voice, and Mac pulls him into his little cubby hole. Mac has visuals on the predator. Dylan is going to try to flush it towards Mac. They creep closer towards the predator, and Mac sees the red dots on his forearm. He looks up, and the dots are on his head, and he's beamed in his head and killed. Dutch tells him to come on. It didn't kill you because you were unarmed. No sport. No competition for it. Dylan whispers for Mac, and he sees his dead body. Dylan hears any time in Mac's voice and looks around. The predator flashes its eyes and shoots his arm off while the gun keeps shooting. The predator runs toward him and stabs him in his gut, killing him. The others cross a tree bridge as they hear Dylan's cries. Billy stays behind and ditches his gun. He's ready to fight the predator. The others hear Billy screams as they keep hiking. The predator now kills Poncho with a plasma beam. Dutch shoots at it, but is hit with a plasma shot. Iconic line, get to the chopper, he yells to Anna. Dutch now runs off into the jungle as the predator chases after him. I'm gonna Dutch need to pop- hear I'm gonna need to hear you say that in a little bit more of an Arnold voice. Get to the chopper. That's I don't good. know if that was good That's or not. Good. Oh, that was good. That was good. Okay. <laughs> Uh, where was I? All right. Dutch falls down a cliff into a lake below and now falls over a waterfall. He makes it to a muddy bank. He climbs on up and cover and the mud covers his body. He hears a splash in the water as he crawls up the bank. He now sees the predator's real appearance as he looks like he's short circuiting. He realizes that he can't see him in thermal vision while he's covered in mud. All right, Brian. Uh, and the next two scenes are the ending. Go ahead, man. Yeah. Again, I just want to give Stan Winston's team just all the props in the world. Look on especially Predator's design here. I mean, I know it went through a lot of different redesigns, and, and James Cameron, I think, even had some input on the whole mandible aspect. But man, this obviously is nothing short of legendary, and Winston brought that shit to life. Not Jameis, Stan. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, look at where this mythos went. You know, there's to me, there's just such it's 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 cool for me to think about because I mean, we had nothing to go off of, and you know, here we get little nuanced details down to the tribal aspects of everything. And this design, those fucking dreads, those teeth, I mean, just epicness. Um, Also, the voice of the Predator, I put that in quotations because, you know, the voice of the Predator, it's fucking Optimus Prime. It's Peter Cullen himself, which, I mean, that's like having Vin Diesel voice Groot for some reason. But, hey, I mean, still, it's fucking awesome. That's Optimus Prime. Um you know, another fun fact here is uh, Bill Duke improvised the whole shaving. And I've, I I really have never even hardly thought twice about it. Just saw it as like a little tick, you know, something he did to, to, to just be a badass and stand out from. But I've heard you guys have said like six or seven little comments about he's shaving for no fucking reason. I mean, I, I don't know. I've never really paid that much attention to it, but I think it's funny. No facial hair. Um, but but <laughs> but it's just like I said, it's just. I don't know. It makes him more badass. It's just, I'm going to start just shaving just randomly too. I'm just going to start bringing, but I got facial hair to look weird. Um, anyway, the crew scrambled on set to make a razor that squirts blood because I, <laughs> because he was improvising that whole shaving thing. But, uh, and speaking of Mac, spoiler alert, my favorite death is fucking awesome. Um, I, I do hate that it's followed up by pretty terrible CGI or whatever it was then optic effects or whatever with Apollo Creed's arm being blown off. I mean, it's awesome. It's, you know, that, that, that it's still like laying on the ground and still shooting. Uh, I thought that looked good, but the act of it, I don't know, just, it didn't work for me. And spoiler alert, that's my least favorite kill here because Ooh. they had a chance to make it up off, you know, but Hey, off screen here, like with the, the Apollo Creed's death, my least favorite. Um, and I know army's arms, Arnie's arms, that's Ar- Schwarzenegger's arms. They're, they're huge, but look, the man just blew off Apollo Creed's arms with one shot and you know it, he just takes it to the shoulder like it's like yeah. it's no problem so i kind of <laughs> you know i mean you, you do get get to the chopper so it's definitely worth it but but that's a the big issue with me that's going to keep this movie from getting rated a 10 in my book so i know that's petty Kruger, but hey there's a few issues here um you know lastly 
I know Mythbusters did an episode on being covered in mud, not taking down body temperature, but man, fuck Mythbusters. This is fucking awesome. And one of those best scenes, one of the best scenes in this movie uh, with the built up tension, very Rambo esque. Amazing there. Definitely made up for the issues I had earlier in this set of scenes. Go ahead, Mike. All right. These two sets. So this set of scenes and the end are, to me, a really good movie. (laughs) Like, I'm, I'm a fan of it from here on out. Like, I don't. Hate it. Now, I have some nitpicks, obviously, but like from here on out, we get a lot of action. We, we get more of a stalkerish villain, you know, coming up soon. I, I like that. Like, I think that's really good. Um, they're out here, man. Th- this group finds a way to set some some booby traps, man. Like, they're <laughs> they use the most ridiculous shit that, they, that I, I didn't know they had with them to set up traps to catch an invisible monster. Um, you know, I'll. <sighs> Out of context, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but I do like that scene, and I think Predator kind of, sh- you know, shooting through it to, you know, now everyone's seen him. I think that's really good. Um, the death of Dylan, Brian, you mentioned it. The lasting visual of the hand continuing to shoot is really cool. Like, I think that's a really cool effect, but the death in and of itself is, meh. It's not my least favorite kill because there's an off-screen one that I think is bullshit. But it's it's a it's meh to me. Um, yeah, you now this is where Schwarzenegger is actually good. Not necessarily acting, but his character. Man, he becomes just this 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 badass that takes the same shot to the shoulder, which you mentioned. Like it, it doesn't uh, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me either. But I want to forgive it because, like you said, it's fucking Arnold, man. Like <laughs> I mean, just the freaking beast. Now. Him covering himself in mud and the Predator not being able to see him, I think is probably my favorite quote-unquote twist or plot line of this movie. Like, I think that's a really creative way to get around the fact that this Predator has been using body temperature the entire film. Um, Now, I know Mythbusters busted it, and you're right. I'm not a big fan of that either. But I do like the effects of Arnold. Now, sometimes this mud looks like shit. Like, the kind of shit that they have on uh, pro wrestling when they cover the McMahon family in it and stuff. Like, that's kind of how this mud looks. But I'm a fan of that visual of, of Arnold just kind of setting up shop. He realizes, oh, he didn't fucking see me. Let's go. And so this is where the movie cranks up a volume, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm excited for what's uh, to come here in the final set of scenes. Go ahead, Andrew. Favorite set of scenes right here. All right, so now we got this classic 80s movie montage. You know, if this was Rocky, he'd be, you know, Rocky Four, he'd be training up in the Siber- uh, up in the Siberian wilderness working out. It's, you know, let me get a chance to everybody to show off their muscles, this, that, and the other. But you got to feel bad for Poncho. You know, he's probably f- looks like he's about 5'7", about 175 pounds soaking wet. You know, out here with these guys that are just mass, mass humanity. You know, bulging biceps, you know huge just huge guys this is if you watch this is why he didn't take his shirt off i mean if if i was in that situation i wouldn't take my shirt off either i'd, I'd just feel so bad about it i mean see you really really just gotta feel like so bad for the guy you know we can jump ahead to uh when mac goes running up the hill and dylan goes chasing after him you know which it's very admirable of him he's been you know cia prick pretty much the entire movie he knows he's probably getting paid triple what everybody else is getting paid so he's probably going to lord that over him if he was ever to make it out of there but they're coming up with their plan on how they're going to attack him. And, you know, they both can see the predator up on, you know, whether it be a branch or a plank or whatever it is. Go back and watch that scene. Really watch that scene. you Because you can see the predator, even though he's camouflaged, he's up there moving. But it kind of, every time I see it, I can't get it out of my mind. It's like he's laying, like, belly down on a couch. Like, he's sliding real seductively. I mean, it's almost like you're watching some like something that we would watch when we were younger on, you know, Cinemax at 1 o'clock in the morning. Just just go back and look at it and tell me you can't unsee that. So now they got their plan of attack. They're going to, you know, move out on the side, flush him out, and, and then nail the bastard. So then Mac crawls underneath these logs and... You, you don't I don't recall even seeing his M60 anymore you know it's very tactically unsound you know if what happened does happen you know there's going to be no time for him to rack he he can't get up he can't run away he can't flip over can't go back the way he came surely can't grab his weapon so he was pretty much doomed from the get-go uh then we get to the scene where uh Dylan hears the uh the classic uh turn around and you know he starts scanning his field of fire so to speak and I've always prided myself you know 
silly like that. You know, as you scan through it the first time, I can spot the predator. Uh, it's not very easy to do unless you once, but once you do it the first time, you'll be able to see it every time. But then when it when it scans back, coming back the way that you had just seen, you can really see them, especially when the eyes light up and everything like that. Now, when Dylan goes to raise his gun and it's in slow motion, that's like telltale sign. Okay, poor guy, he's done for. If you ever watch the uh, Calamity of Jaws four. Hmm. When Jake gets taken off of the uh, front of the boat, everything's in slow motion. Like, okay, he's pretty much done for. But the way they do it, you know, I rather enjoy it. You know, we get to see our second example after Blaine of the, pow of the power of the shoulder cannon. You know, takes his arm right off. And then, you know, when he starts running in for the attack, you know, Dylan's, everything's on Dylan's point of view is still slow motion versus the Predator himself is actually, you know, running at basically full speed. So that's really, uh, it's kind of a dead giveaway. I like the, uh, the, the way they did the Predator when he's running from the side. Like he's like full speed, you know, Carl Lewis style, like bearing down on you. When he starts aiming forward at him, you know, it, it, it looks a little clunky. But, you know, still, you know, all right, it's, something bad's about to happen. And then when he gets nailed, you know, it's, it's all she wrote for him. Now, next, I want to talk about what's definitely my least favorite kill in the movie. So we've already seen, you know, Dylan get his arm blown off by the cannon. Uh, they're trying to drag Poncho out of there with his, with his broken ribs and everything like that. And after uh, Billy meets his end off camera, uh, Poncho basically takes a, a plasma blast to the side of the head. Now, we saw, you know, like I said earlier, Dylan lose his arm. It just took it right off. You know, Blaine took his entire back out. And all it does is just knock him down like he'd been hit with a boxing glove. You know, there's a great opportunity to basically, you know, just blown the entire head off. And I know in later movies, they actually do that. Maybe, you know, they didn't want to get, you know, any issues with the MMPA. But, you know, it just, after after seeing what that weapon can do, and then just basically see him get knocked down and, almost, and just almost like blunt force trauma versus, you know, actually head blown completely off, that was just a missed opportunity for me. And now my, the final thing I took a note on about this uh, set of scenes is after Dutch, you know, goes all the way down the waterfalls and starts making his crawl up and he's kind of got that, you know, let me take a breath to myself. You see uh, Predator splash down in the water. You know, not the best graphics for the way they do the splash, but it's almost our, you know, first full-fledged good long reveal. When you see the, uh, you know, whatever those dreadlock things he's has come flickering up out of the water and all the spikes. It's, you know, that's, it's very jaws like to me, you know, just coming, coming towards you and you don't really see nothing but the water moving and you see, um, you know, the stuff pop up out of there. I've always thought that was real cool. He comes out of the water, uh, Dutch is, you know, inadvertently, you know, camouflaged himself, but he's able, when he climbs up inside the trees and kind of banks in there, when you see the predator's point of view as he's scanning through there, uh, you can kind of see a slight outline of like Dutch's face and his arm buried up amongst the trees. Now, since the predator doesn't have depth perception, you know, that it, from our point of view, it looks like he wouldn't be able to see him. And he's also been used to seeing these guys the whole time because he can see their body heat. So even though, you know, you can kind of see an outline of Dutch there, he doesn't think, you know, to, you know, assume that Dutch is not completely camouflaged like that because they had not done anything like that yet to show that, you know, they were able to figure out how to hide from him. Yeah, so um, this set of scenes, uh, the biggest pet peeve I have is Max shaving his face. Um, listen, I I don't know. I, I just don't see how it's... I, I texted you guys when I was watching today. I said, why the fuck is this man shaving his bald face when they're booby-trapping the jungle? Um, it just doesn't It doesn't make sense to me. It's like a weird little nervous tick that they added in. Um, anyway, too much time spent on that. Now, the biggest pet peeve that i realistically have is the inconsistency in the damage uh inflicted like you guys have already touched on like it's just blows his blows one guy all to shit barely affects the other um could have been more consistent there would have really helped uh sell the destructiveness of the predator um the you know i'm gonna keep it short and sweet because you guys have touched on a lot of stuff but you know i did like the the mud scene was really cool and the revelation of the predator, like the full scene, like the full shot, like you said, coming out of the water, thought that was awesome. Um, but him being covered in mud, that was just a nice touch to me because you're like, okay, looks like he has a chance here. And then when we get later in the film and he gets thrown back into the water, it's like, oh shit! It it, it, it just provides that oh shit moment 
like all his defense is gone. And so it starts right here. And I thought that was a really cool, um, really cool touch that they added. I agree with the Mythbusters thing. I mean, but whatever. I, I don't hate Mythbusters for it. Come on. That guy's got a fantastic mustache. Go ahead, Nico. Fuck them Mythbusters and them birds, man. Fuck them both. All right, so this week we don't get a we don't get a fuck them kids award, but we do get a fuck them birds award. <laughs> uh, uh, I would like to point out, Nico. One, I like the idea of the predators cloak short short circuiting because of water. That's a really good idea. Yeah. Two, this this episode does not have a call me sometime. Just thought I'd throw it out there. Anna can call me sometime. Eh. <laughs> I said, eh. My man was going to have grandma from the visit calling. That was clearly some fucking nerve. Although she's kind of a sexy grandma, you know. I'm just saying. My man wanted the granny from It Chapter Two to call him, but but that's not true. That's not true. My man, my man wanted the woman from The Shining, the old woman upstairs from The Shining, to call him, but not not Anna. You know who can call me? I'm turning over a new leaf. You know who can call me? My fiance, Catherine. Thank you. All right, all right. Let's let's knock out his ending real quick. <laughs> all right, Dutch goes back into the jungle and starts to make more traps to try and kill this thing. We see the predator rip Billy's spine out of his body. Dutch looks at the big full moon and lights a torch and yells, declaring war. The predator takes notice and heats his blades up. Dutch tosses his torch to the ground and climbs up a tree. We see the predator jump tree to tree, and we see it right behind Dutch now as it crawls right past him. He swings over to another tree. He gets out his bow and arrow and shoots a grenade-like arrow at him. The Predator now launches plasma beams into the jungle towards him. Dutch runs away and hides out. We see the Predator is damaged. The Predator lands right in his path, and Dutch hides under the tree, holding on tightly as it walks right over him. Dutch tosses a rock to distract it, and he throws an explosive like javelin, landing another hit. He sees the blood along the rocks and trees. He, pr- he pursues after it, and the Predator is right behind him. He throws an explosive behind him and runs off and lands in a pool of water, washing his mud camouflage off. It grabs Dutch and pins him to the wall by the neck and examines him. He drops Dutch and removes his face shield. You're one you're one ugly motherfucker, Dutch says as the predator roars at him. It backhands Dutch, launching him and strikes him over and over. Dutch crawls and tries to lure it into the trap. Come on, kill me, do it now. He bypasses one trap but lands into so another. Good, okay. You're doing What's so up? good. You're doing. So I really don't know if I'm so doing a good job or not, doing, but I'm winging it. <laughs> I think you're doing fantastic. Hey, as long, hey, my mom said I was cute. He bypasses one trap but lands into another where a tree lands on him, crushing him. We see the tree moving, and Dutch grabs a rock to crush his head, descent style. He tosses the rock and asks, what the hell are you? He mimics his voice and now sets off a timer on his wrist. The predator starts to laugh evilly now. Dutch runs away as fast as he can. We see a huge explosion in the background. The helicopter sees the explosion. We see Dutch standing buff and triumphantly. The chopper lands and rescues Dutch. The film ends with the chopper flying away over the jungle, and we get some really fun end credits with uh, the people kind of posing <laughs> with their name shown up. All right, Brian, go ahead. It's kind of a, I mean, there's some things I'd, I would change here at the ending. Uh, I haven't given props to Kevin Peter Hall. He was the predator for 90% of this movie. He also played Bigfoot on uh, Harry and the Hendersons back in the day, too. But but I think his tall, over seven-foot ass was tremendous here, especially in the uh, tussle with the muscle here at the end. My, uh, my only real complaint here, I think, of this whole set of scenes is, is the laughing at the end with the predator when he's about to set that bomb off. I, I, to me, I didn't like that. And, and I love the character of Dutch. You know, hey, by the way, Shan, if your boyfriend's got any extra jungle, you know, Nika jungle Dutch figures, hit me up. But, you know, it, I love the character of Dutch, but I, I don't think that they should have had him survive. Like, I think that it would have just been a better ending with the whole thing blowing up and and, and that kind of been it. But, uh, you know, and I know there's rumors of, of Arnold, you know, coming back for a few of these other other movies. But like I said, I kind of wish Dutch would have would have hung it up here. But, you know, other than that. Great movie, great ending. Yeah, I'm a big fan of this <laughs> of this kind of like fight scene face off thing. I think it's really good um, for someone who doesn't. Again, I said it like four times. Not a big fan of action movie. To me, this is more so of the final horror face off. And I know we get some explosions and like weird things, but I love the reveal of Predator 
such a cool look, an ugly, like Arnold said, an ugly motherfucker for real. Um, I think that that's probably my one takeaway from this movie is that's a really cool creature. Like I'm not a creature feature guy for the most part, but I think they do a really good job with the effect there. I think it looks pretty sick. Um, and again, I like the fact that we get the mud coming off of Arnold. I think that's, you know, like a cool, uh Oh moment that you get. But, um, again, they they incorporate enough of the rest of the movie here. You know, you get him kind of, you get predator kind of laughing and, you know, he's self-destructing and all that stuff. And I think that ends up, uh, uh, really cool. So, as far as the end of the film goes, I would have probably ended it like Brian with the death of Dutch because once he's rescued in the helicopter, I'm like, eh. Now, one thing I, I think it, it's funny, I don't like it for this movie, but it's funny is the final scene where everyone's introduced like they're on full house, like whatever happened to predictability to the milkman paper boy. Like that's, what, <laughs> that's like, that's what's going on there. And I'm like, it's funny. It doesn't work for the movie, but it's really funny. Uh, so I all like the few times I've seen it, I was like, I forget that's there. That's just like, that's like family matters and full house. Like it was very, very of its time, which I think, you know, uh, adds a little bit of, uh, cheesiness, not necessarily in a bad way. So again, all in all, the last two sets of scenes are my favorites in the movie because I think there's that's the closest we get to having a true horror film, and so maybe that's why I enjoy them the most. Now that shit, now the song stuck in my head. Milkman, the paper boy. Great song. Get your right, Andrew. Now in this last group here, this is, you know, the, where it becomes an entirely different movie. It goes from being, you know, 80s action shoot 'em up to more of a, uh, you know, you know, sword and sorcery kind of thing almost just depend on the the way they shot it. It always reminded me of that. I always am amused by when he set building all his traps. When I was a kid, I thought that he just had a whole lot of vine to tie everything down. But as I've gotten older, I've, I've come to realize that's what's called 550 cord that he's using to tie it off. Now, the only person I can remember in the entire movie that ever has any kind of additional gear besides their, uh, their assigned weapon is just, uh, Hawkins with his radio, his radio pack. Other than that, nobody has anything. So my question that I was asking myself as well as rewatching this and taking my notes like is where did he keep all that 550 cord? I mean, he, you know, got cargo pockets, but probably used up what I would thought be the initial stash of the 550 cord set in the first set of traps. So now he's got all this extra stuff, it, you know, just one of those little things that my mind just, just randomly thinks of, uh, the scene when he lights the torch and gives his, you know, primal scream, all right, it's time to do final battle, and everything like that. If you close your eyes or if you walk in right on that particular scene, you forget that it is a sci-fi movie. You forget that it's a, you know, army action movie. I mean, it's literally like right out of Conan the Barbarian because it just, just the way they shot it, the backdrop, how everything looked. I've always just thought every time that scene comes up, it's like, okay, this is, you know, cool. This is your definite transition. Okay, it's now enti something entirely different. Now, on the flip side of that, as soon as he does that roar and the predator hears it and starts looking around, like I said earlier, he takes his uh, little targeting system and starts heating up his his blades. That's the only reference you see him do before. It's the only you don't see him do it since. I don't even recall seeing it in any of the uh, follow-on movies that it ever happens. You know, it, nice visual maybe, but as pointless as tits on a turtle. Now, something I always think of after he get you know gets up again in the tree and he's waiting for the predator to come out from the tree that oddly enough is directly above him as he's looking down on the fire where he's got his trap set at uh you've got this distorted camera view it's like i don't it's like they chose the wrong lens to shoot the fire but for some reason the way he's sitting with his bow strapped across his back it always looks like cobra Khan to me the old bad guy from the he-man characters it was the uh it was a toy that you got that uh, you could fill with the body with water and squirt it but for some reason that's what i always think of when i see that little particular scene now, once the predator gets down on the bridge and he hits him with the uh, hits the booby trap, and it basically shorts out his uh, his particular camouflage system. Now we get the uh, the classic, you know, one on one battle for lack of a better term. Arnold is now a final girl. Uh, they go back and forth. In my mind, like there's nothing particularly that like stands out. It's it's a little bit cool. Uh, the scene when he follows him into the cave because he's following the blood trail, and you hear the blood dripping and everything like that. But then once he dives out of the cave and, you know, breaks off, hits on the log and falls off and basically watches his own camouflage off. So now it's, you know, both of them completely out in the open. 
this is where it really comes home for me. Uh, he jams the uh, his wrist spikes down on top of the log, picks him up, and holds him up against the wall. And you get to see, you know, how much larger Kevin Peter Hall is than Arnold Schwarzenegger. And then we get that uh, slow reveal, one of the most cool scenes in the movie, where he slowly, you know, takes his uh, shoulder cannon off, pulls his mask off, and now it's time to throw Dukes. Uh, and then after they exchange pleasantries, for lack of a better term, Predator gives out that his own primal scream, throws the arms out, and, you know, if we'd had subtitles, it would have been basically Predator for your ass is now mine. The only thing I didn't understand as well about this is, uh, like, he's, he's, you see what he can see the whole time with his, uh, you know, heat vision, everything like that. Doesn't have the greatest depth perception, as I said earlier, but when he removes his mask and it's basically all just red, my God, I mean, with the, whatever technological advances they may have had, they need, you know, give me some goggles or something that he could wear so that he could actually see what's going on. I mean, it's, it's crazy to me. And then you get the, uh, the fight scene, which, you know, the cut back and forth, it's kind of hard to watch, you know, because you really can't see what's going on. You're relying on hearing things. Uh, but I swear, I don't know if it's Arnold or if, I, or if it's the Predator, but as they're fighting, it sounds to me like whoever's either getting hit or doing the hitting is like laughing like a, like a, like a five-year-old child. It creeps me out for some reason. I don't know why, but, you know, I, I really thought that was a, a really, really good touch. And now after that, uh, Arnold is able to, you know, coax him into coming down, drops a log on his head, bing, bang, boom, got the final advantage, you know, blows him or ends up blowing himself up with his own device. Uh, I always watch the end of the movie, uh, go back and tell me if uh, I'm crazy, but as this, after the bomb explodes and you see the helicopter coming in, and another nice fun fact, that is a seven foot two tall Kevin Peter Hall flying the helicopter, how they were able to, you know, build that helicopter cockpit to fit his massive frame in there you know that that was a nice bit of work there but as the smoke is starting to clear you can kind of see what looks like dutch walking towards the camera in the smoke and then the smoke gets a little bit bigger and i mean a split second later he's about 30 yards closer standing with his hands on his hips in front of a, a tree trunk that was not there before i don't know if uh if there was like a, a slight, you know, hiccup when they edited the movie, if they, you know, wanted to have him like walking up for a reveal, then they decided to do it the other way. But you can definitely tell that there's two kind of sort of different scenes on that. And then when he's flying out on the helicopter, I've never thought this before in my life. I do a lot with a uh, military travel. And as he's flying away, all I could think to myself last night was when he gets back to his duty location, is he going to file his travel voucher within the regulated five days or are they going to grant him an extension because you know he's been through hell and that's what i got on that set of scene fellas thank you <laughs> All right, so, by the way uh, i've only ever heard that called useless as tits on a boar hog i've never heard that as useless as tits on a turtle so that was definitely a first for me so uh the ending no you're good i like the pacing of the ending um and and you know some of the action was all right so i really like when this when he ripped a spine out you get this silhouette look of predator pulling the the spine out of the uh out of the corpse there that was cool um skull looked a bit small but that's okay uh i love the fact that two out of the last three reviews we've done have had some great lines about physical appearance this one's got you ugly motherfucker and then a couple weeks ago we had roddy piper delivering real fucking ugly and so uh top-notch dialogue there in both of those yeah. um i do like when the mud came off like i said earlier you get that oh shit moment where you're like damn that was his line of defense that was his camouflage and now it's gone oh shit oh shit um now the fight scene to me was kind of funny at times like when the predators got him pinned up against a tree and he punches him in the face like it kind of looked like a weak ass punch if i'm being honest um and then, uh, you know, another moment he hit him and he went flying. So, again, with the inconsistency of how much damage he can really inflict. But it was okay. I, th I thought it was I thought it was a, a decent action scene there. And I had some back and forth suspense. You didn't know who was going to prevail. Um, but when he sets off the trap and he's got him pinned to the ground, I hated the fact that he showed mercy and didn't smash his fucking face with the rock. Or, like, he let him set the set the detonator on the bomb i hated that and then i hate like that's that's such a 
dissatisfactory um, death to the predator. So I mentioned earlier that normally all those gorilla and, uh, and Russian deaths from the huge action scene, normally any one of those would be my least favorite death. But the predator is just because I felt like we deserved more than just a cop out of, oh, it's, it's going to set off a bomb and kill itself and nuke the whole fucking jungle. Um, I thought we deserved more. And the funniest part of the entire movie, like Mike said, is that end credit scene. What the fuck is this? An, an 80s sitcom or a serious action horror movie? Um, but it was, and, uh, you know, I don't know. It was, it was just, I was, I was waiting for Carl Winslow to come strolling across, come walking down the stairs. But anyway, decent ending to a, to a movie that I felt like at this point, I was like, all right, it's, it's kind of went on a little long, but it's an okay movie. All right. Any more final thoughts? All right, Andrew, I know you said you had a couple of fun facts you wanted to say first. Let's do our fun facts. You want to go ahead and go? So I have uh, two fun facts for this movie. To the best of my knowledge, uh, this, as long as as well as with The Running Man, is the only movies in the history of cinema that two future governors were actually stars in the movie. Uh, Jesse Ventura and Arnold Schwarzenegger were both in this and Running Man. I have, you know, did a, you know, a semi thorough Google search and could never come up with that. That's that's one I always found amusing. Uh, my favorite fun fact on this one is that uh, there's a well known fact that uh, the original Predator was to be played by Jean Claude Van Damme. Uh, combination of you know him being a little bit hard to work with, the uh, suit not being comfortable, uh, him having you know physical problems with the suit, as well as you have like a what five seven five eight Van Dam in a, in a movie with for a, the most part you know six foot two to six foot five inch guys really just didn't work so they ended up recasting uh, Kevin Peter Hall much larger guy you know much more physically imposing especially with the suit uh, if you ever go and watch uh, the most recent Predators movie a version of the uh, red suit that they used uh, to film the jungle scenes that would have been the bug-like creature that was going to be the Predator actually does show up as a cameo in the Halloween trick-or-treat scene when the uh, main character's son's walking through and he's got the Predator mask on. He walks by a large red-looking cockroach-style creature, and that is actually the suit that was to be used for the original Predator. And those are my fun facts. Oh, yeah. I only got two fun facts. Um we said a lot of them tonight that I had earlier. Uh, Dutch's line, get to the chopper, is Arnold Schwarzenegger's personal favorite catchphrase of all of his films that he appears in. And the last one I have is uh, Dutch's line of stick around after he, you know, stabs the guy with the machete or whatever. Uh, that was apparently improvised by him. That's the only two fun facts I had left over. Dustin, you got any? Yeah, I got a couple. Um... I know Money Mike's got the money locked down. Yeah, I got a couple. So I, you know, I mentioned, or uh, I think Mike, it was you that mentioned how we don't get a lot of screen time with Predator. Like we felt like we didn't see enough. Uh, eight minutes of total screen time, and it was a kind of a. It was one of my biggest gripes with Jaws, which I get why they didn't show it in Jaws because the shark didn't particularly look great. Predator looked awesome. Uh, we only got eight minutes of screen time. Would have loved to see more. Uh, the tree that the predator was standing on was made of concrete in order to support the weight of the of uh, the actor in his costume the suit alone weighed 200 pounds uh the way that they got the mud all over arnold was they shot it out of a hose similar to how you spread a uh, stucco and this was jesse the body ventura's acting debut in film so it's so interesting notes there okay uh the production budget on predator was 88 million and worldwide, it grossed $160.5 million. So, makes sense why it became a franchise that made its budget back times two, or almost times two. So, um, it makes sense why it kind of became a franchise, and, and it's so beloved by many by, uh, Damn. by many people. Yeah, $80 million is a lot of fucking money in 1987. Oh, $88 million. That's a lot of money. Like, they, they dropped some cash on this. Serious cash, straight cash, huh? Oh, wait. Cash. This is wrong. We can fix that. Are you ready for the correct numbers? <laughs> <laughs> Take that. Rewind it back. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Predator was made for 15 to $18 million, depending on where you look. And oh. the box office was $98.3 million worldwide at the time in 1987. 
So um, that, if you account for inflation and all that, made a shit ton of money. All right, before we jump into our rating, we got a few fan questions. A uh, friend of the show, Trey <laughs> Rowland, uh, he said, Predator is the best unofficial combination of two movies in one in the history of mankind. First <laughs> bit is a traditional Arnold Jungle action flick. Second is a sci-fi alien horror stalk fest. Similar vibe to From Dust Till Dawn, just like 800 times better. Discuss. <laughs> I won't say it's 800 times better, and I honestly think From Dust Till Dawn kind of did this, the swap, the switch a little better because it didn't have the thermal throughout the whole movie. Well, I didn't read that, and like I was actually, whenever Dustin was talking about not getting the thermal until a certain point, and not showing anything until just bam. That's I actually almost said, oh, from like Dust Till Dawn. So I I didn't even read that, <laughs> but I you know I I agree with you. I don't I don't, I, don't, I think Dust Till Dawn did that a lot better. But uh, I mean, I did take away from the movie to me. Since we're discussing uh, from Dust Till Dawn, just sit back and imagine for a second. Replace the lady who played Anna with a little uh, Selma Hike. Tell me what you think about that. Hey, down with that. I say, sure. that movie had Selma Hayek. This one does not. I rest my case. I, I would actually... Also, that movie uh, had pussy, 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 pussy. <laughs> well, this one, had, this one had quite a few instances of the word pussy. Um, I, as much as I love Trey, uh, Trey's one of my favorite uh, people I've interacted with on Twitter. He's wrong. He actually got it backwards from Dust Till Dawn. It's about 800 times better than this movie. Respectfully, Ooh. we love to see it. Hyperbole, but still. All right. Uh, the next question is from uh, Sean Irwin. Uh, classic movie he wrote. Do you consider this a movie where no one makes bad decisions? I think Brian touched on this. So that's like, I really don't know. Uh, the only bad decision I'll say for sure is Billy. What stopping in the middle of the tree trying to fight this guy? You need to stay with the pack. That's the only one I can think of right off the top of my head. Yeah, no, I agree. I don't, I don't, I don't think they did anything wrong. Well, I was gonna say Dutch made a bad decision by trusting his old pal and agreeing to go on this whole thing because yeah, otherwise, was about- everybody would still be alive. <laughs> I was saying that's what I was about to say. Not a bad call per se, but a very unfortunate choice Dutch yeah. made by trusting his old friend. What do you think, Andrew? I actually think there are two back-to-back bad decisions that are being made. The first one is when the first time we see Anna, she comes up behind Arnold. She's got the pistol in her hand. She should have cocked the hammer back before she came into the room. Had she not cocked the hammer back right there behind him where he was within earshot, you know, he never would have heard her. She'd have put a bullet in the back of his brain. We'd be watching an entirely different movie. The second mistake that is made is by Arnold right after that because, you know, he's just gone through and moaned down probably, you know, 70, 80 guys, uh, not even caring, just shooting, loving life, having a good time. But for some reason with her, when he hears her cock the hammer on the pistol, he butt strokes her in the mouth with his rifle and then, for lack of a better term, uses a motion that is like he's going to jab her with a bayonet, which, of course, he doesn't have the bayonet on the end of it. Had he just turned and fired, Anna would be dead then Anna would not have escaped the group. Hawkins would have not got separated from the group and Hawkins would have never been killed, which would have then broke the group up trying to search for Hawkins' body. Very well also could have been an entirely different movie. So I would definitely say those are two mistakes that were made by characters in the movie. All right. I can't argue with that. Nope. Oh, we got one Fair more enough. question. Uh, Mark Heff on Instagram wrote, Hey fellas. And this is something that Andrew just touched on. Have you seen the set pics of John Claude Van Damme as a predator? What did you think of the costume? And do you think the movie would have been such a hit if they went that route? And he also wrote, love the show. You fellas are nailing it with the hand clap emoji. Appreciate that. Yes, I did Google the, uh, the costume yeah. and it looked pretty terrible. And I probably would not like this movie. <laughs> True. I'm very glad it ended up how it ended up. That's what Same. I'll say. Yeah, much, so much, much better. Much better. Andrew, this is your, this was your pick. Do you want to go first? Or do you want to go last in your, uh, in the rating? And favorite kill, least favorite kill. I'll go ahead and go first. Uh, favorite kill uh, had to be Blaine. Uh, not only was the visual cool 
you know, it's the first time you really get to see the plasma cannon and the damage it can do. Uh, but more importantly to me into the story, uh, he takes out the biggest guy with the biggest gun with absolutely no effort whatsoever. Uh, it immediately tells the guys that are in the movie, and it also tells me as the audience member, okay, this is, you know, this is something entirely different. Uh, you know, we, it, up until that point, we still hadn't seen the Predator yet, but, you know, we had no idea what he was really capable of. But then we get to see, you know, the biggest and possibly the baddest, you know, with his size combined with his weapon guy stood absolutely no chance. So what are we going to be able to do with this guy? It's just, I, I love it. And least favorite kill, as I'd said before earlier, definitely Poncho. You know, as I said with Blaine just a minute ago, we see what his weapon's capable of. We saw what it did to Dylan. And again, it shoots in the head the smallest guy in the group and basically just knocks him down like he was in a boxing match, match and got hit in the side of the head. Again, a missed opportunity. Uh, I, I, it just That's my least favorite kill for sure. All right, uh, so now for my rating. Uh, this movie is one of three movies that no matter where I'm at, what I'm doing, if it's on, it doesn't matter where it's at in the movie, I'm going to sit down and watch. The other two movies are uh, Major League, all-time best comedy, I think, in my mind, and in my favorite martial arts movie of all time, Showdown in Little Tokyo. Don't know why, but I love it. Uh, but anytime I can say, you know, if it's, a, if it's a movie like this, I can sit down and watch whenever, wherever. Uh, it takes me back to my childhood of playing a... Uh, you see the movie, you go out in the woods and we'd play war for like two or three hours just, you know, watching a couple scenes of this movie. Um, every time I watch it, I enjoy it more. I, I tend to watch it with closed captionings on just so I can, you know, because I, I don't need to see what's going on. I just like to read the dialogue, you know, pick up anything I may have missed. Uh, so for me, you know, I have to give it a 10. Great, great movie. Uh, just, just absolutely love it. I love Major League. Okay, 10 out of 10. I respect it, man. Ooh. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go next. Uh, favorite kill. I chose Dylan getting his arm shot off and then the stab with the predator. I know it's Brian's least favorite, but I like that kill a lot. Uh, least favorite, uh, me and me and me and Brian are completely opposites on the, on the kills. Uh, least favorite, the pig. Just kidding. Uh, Mac, just cause there's way too much of his head remaining when we see his body again. It looked like it got like blown off. Then when yeah, you come back to that. it, it's, his whole head that. back again. Dead meat pointed that out, and I couldn't not see it uh, when I rewatched. I, wait, I wouldn't count. I wouldn't count that. <laughs> okay, it, it just bothered me. I mean, you could have easily picked any of the, you know, off-screen gorilla kills or whatever. But uh, this, I just wrote a little summary. This movie has nostalgia with me, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, I've always enjoyed this movie, albeit the latest rewatch did bring it down a little. Uh, like I said earlier, it gets a little monotonous, a little slow in the middle for me. Just going to the jungle, setting some traps up, blah, 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 over and over. Uh, but the look of the Predator is so badass, and the battle between it and Arnold is still – I still really like that a lot. But I gave it a 7.75. Seven, All right, I'll go ahead and go. My favorite kill is Blaine. My least favorite kill is all the air flips in the big action <laughs> sequence. Uh Because they look – all they all look like Jeff Hardy off a ladder, and I know that's like my third rep. My third wrestling reference tonight, but that's all I can think of. Uh, they all like blew through the air like Rey Mysterio, and I'm I'm good on that. So that's probably my least favorite. Um, so this movie's last thirty minutes, or maybe like twenty ish minutes, I thoroughly enjoy. Like I think it's a good like little short horror movie, but just a lot of the stuff beforehand, it's just not my cup of tea. I don't care for a lot of action flicks, and it's not that I even think that it's done poorly. It's just not for me. Um, I think it's a little campy, uh, but I also don't have the nostalgia that the rest of you have or, or, or not Dustin, but the other three, I just don't, I didn't grow up on it. Um, I only saw the movie for the first time five years ago, you know, six years ago, whatever it is. And so I think it, I understand why so many people enjoy it, but I, but going into it, this review, I knew that this just, you know, I was hoping all, all, upon a rewatch, I would like it a little more than I did. But uh, it turned out not to be the case. So all that being said, I gave it a 5.5 because I do think there's – and I don't even think that that's that bad because there's about 45 to 50 minutes of this movie that I just don't care if it exists. Don't make that face of me. <laughs> I just got memed. I know I did. No. You will. <laughs> you definitely I will. I know I totally did. Let me go ahead and knock mine out since uh, Mike and I are kind of on the same page here. Um, my favorite kill – 
I went with uh, Dylan just because, like, like you said, it was Nico's it's a cool shot. I like how his arm fell and he's still holding the, holding the trigger down. That was just a cool shot to me. Realistic or not, I don't care. Rigor Mortis already set in. Um, least favorite kill, like I mentioned, was the Predator. I feel like we were owed more than what we got, and I hated the fact that Dutch just had pity on him. And Like, this damn thing's been trying to kill you all movie, and you're just going to have pity on it let him die under his log. Um, overall, the movie does not have nostalgia for me at all. I just saw it today for the first time, like I mentioned. Um, it The runtime is really felt because I feel like the first 45 minutes is not spent advancing any kind of storyline other than getting them to the jungle. Um, it's, it's like, like I said, and like Trey said, it really does combine two different movies, like a uh, 45 minutes, you get a twist and a turn to where it's a separate film than it began being it's just they kind of spoiled it by the thermal vision and the spaceship scene so uh all things considered it's not the worst movie we reviewed i don't hate the movie at all i just think it's a very okay movie and uh it was about as middle of the road as you can get which is out of a 10 point scale of five about as middle of the road as you can get all right so i'll bring our average up a little bit here um best death again mac worst death Apollo creed um, I said that earlier. Uh, I, I love this movie. Um, I don't like Predator 2, but The Predators with Adrian Brody is, uh, to me, the the sequel to this. And then after that comes Alien vs. Predator, the first one. So that's kind of how I see this this uh, series here. But uh, I love this. There are a few few nitpicks that keep me from, from going, you know, perfect score with it. But I gave it a 9.25. Okay, uh, so that gives us a composite average of a 7.5. I think that's what, ain't IMDb like 7, 5, 7, 8, something like that? Yeah, this week they know what they're doing, I guess. Shit, fuck IMDb, no. Mythbusters, and Birds. They, they've got them at a 7.8. I like to go, on this movie in particular, I like to go by the Metascore, which is a 45 out of 100. So that's what I'm going to trust this week. Ooh. Meta, does, Meta doesn't belong in horror anyways. Let's move on. Uh, oh, any- <laughs> God. Jesus Christ. Just I'm kidding. To- just kidding. You're being very rude in front of our guest. <laughs> Speaking of facts. Company, boys. Just kidding. No. Uh, thank you again for donating and coming on the show. We had a great time. Uh, we're going to close the- just going to close the episode sa- the episode out just by thanking all of our blood donors we've had. Uh, just want to give a quick shout out. You know, we started that new Patreon, the reoccurring uh, the members. Uh, our camp level is Clayton J. And the second one, we kind of don't know the last name. She just put her name Nina. So big shout out to Nina. And our camp counselor is my guy, Hunter Nelson. And uh, really appreciate you, Hunter. We are so excited by the participation in this blood donor campaign. For those of you who don't know or may be new, we have launched a new Patreon campaign called Blood Donors. We have five donor tiers that range from, you know, just $5 monthly donation to even one-time donations as well. And and in exchange for keeping the lights on, we've added perks such as early content to bonus episodes, autographed pictures, t-shirts, and even joining us for an episode of your choice. Any donation goes straight to helping with web hosting, SoundCloud hosting, guest procurement. Again, you know, just thank you guys and girls so much. We have some of the best loyal listeners. We love each and every one of you. We can't believe every day that we get to do this. Just go to don'tgooutthere.com and click donate. And oh, yes, there will be blood. But again, not real blood. This is money, you animals. Uh, before we get out of here, Brian, let's announce your pick for next week. We're, ta- we're going back to M. Night Shyamalan's camp. What's your pick? My favorite M. Night movie is Signs. Signs, signs everywhere. Signs. Oh, fuck. I saw the sign and it opened up my. Sorry. All right, let's end the episode on Brian singing. Uh, appreciate you, Andrew, one more time. Uh, I had a yes, great time you, talking about Predator. I know this was a movie we were going to do eventually because, yeah. I mean, I like Predator. I would have picked it. I'm sure Brian would have or Trey would have came back on. But I had a great time talking about Predator. Uh, takes me back to my childhood. Uh, thank you to all of our listeners. I really appreciate it. 
Uh, y'all have a good one. We'll be back with signs next week. Fuck them birds. And fuck them kids. Just want to remind everybody. Uh-